This evening, uh, I'm broadcasting actually from the Mirage Resort in Las Vegas, Nevada, where I'm at the EXP Com. Uh, it's uh, their convention. And uh, so if you hear some noise in the background, that's everyone uh, going to their convention classes and getting figuring out where they're going to go to dinner and all that kind of stuff tonight. Actually, I think there's several uh, open houses and parties going on tonight as well. So. so that's the noise if you hear it. Tonight, we also have Dan Naylor, who is our school owner and uh, man with the technical expertise for tonight to be our producer tonight. Before we get started on tonight's material, do any of you have any questions about any topic? Now would be a good time to ask. Well, seeing as no one has any questions outside of the uh, topics uh, we're gonna be covering tonight, let's just jump right into it, Dan. Let's look at our first question, please. Okay, a property owner T obtains a written easement on a neighbor's property, giving T access to a lake. Which of the following is most likely to happen? Okay, A, the size and value of T's property will increase. B, the size of T's property will increase, but not the value. C, the value of T's property will increase, but not the size. And D, neither the size nor the value will increase. What do you guys think? What is an easement? It's a right to use another's property, uh, usually for ingress and egress. Um, if you have a property near a lake, but you're not on the lake, boy, it would sure be nice to have an easement, which would give you direct access to the lake. So the correct answer to this one is C. Value of T's property will increase, but not the size because it's only a right to use. It doesn't increase your holdings. It just gives you the right, and usually it's for ingress and egress like we just illustrated here. So if you uh, committed to C, uh, pat yourself on the back. You are absolutely right. Let's go to number two, please. R sells property to T with the restriction in the sales agreement that T can only use the property for farming purposes. Well, this is an example of what? A, fee simple with condition precedent. B, deed in lieu of. C, fee simple defeasible or that C, or D, fee remainder estate. Fee remainder estate. Well, this is really, um, he deeded a property with a restriction on it. Now, remain, D, fee remainder estate, that's, that's part of a life estate, which is this is not. This is an example of C, a fee defeasible state. Now, you, when you see fee defeasible, it means that there was a string attached. You know, something ha you know, could happen later on. It's yours, but it's not completely yours. And in this case, he needed the property, but they could only use it for farming purposes. So if they tried to use it for something else, then the a seller of the property could try to, you know, he could go to court and get that property back. He'd have a very good case because it was fee defeasible. Fee defeasible is also sometimes called fee determinable. Um, but if it, but fees, anything short of fee simple absolute, fee simple absolute is the most um, uh, uh, potent, the most complete type of ownership that somebody can have. Deed in lieu of foreclosure, they answered D, uh, B up here. That's, that's used in, in, in lieu of, of foreclosure where you have, it's kind of a, you know, I hate to use the term friendly foreclosure because that's <laughs> no foreclosure is friendly, but it's a situation where rather than making the lender go through all the foreclosure process, the, the, uh, the note, um, you know, the, the gentleman that had the loan and has defaulted on it, instead of getting foreclosed on, he just agreed to give up the property to back to the lender. And that would be done with the deed in lieu of foreclosure. Fee simple with condition precedent. 
uh, is another example of fee simple to feasible, but it doesn't quite define what we had in our stem of the question. So correct answer to this one is C. Let's go to question, or uh, no, that you had D, D and Lua, it should have been C. Okay, okay number three. What is the highest form of ownership with no restrictions? And I already gave that one away by explaining this last question. And that would of course be fee simple absolute. Fee simple absolute is what we work with in real estate almost exclusively. I mean, it, you know, 44 years folks, it's been 44 years of me being in the real estate business and I've only run into two life estates, that's it. You know, two examples of fee to feasible. Tenancy at will is the type of tenancy you have when you check into you know, a resort or a motel like this. And uh, it says, well, I'll be here for the whole week. you know. Uh, but if something happened at home and you could call down the front desk and say, I'm checking out today, um, you know, I've got to get back home. Uh, well, wait a minute, you said you're going to stay with us a whole week. Well, I'm not. you know. But it works the other way too. You know, if uh, um, <laughs> yeah, someone was coming in that, that wanted the whole floor of the hotel, like, you know, some noted political figure or entertainer or whatever, or, or, you know, then they would have to kick everybody out on that floor. And they said, well, wait a minute, we're supposed to be able to stay here the whole week. Well, yeah, I know, but it's tenancy at will. And we decided that this other client is more important. We'll relocate you to another part of the hotel or another hotel across town or something. Okay, life estates, we kind of hit on that a little bit. It's kind of weird science ownership. It is not fee simple absolute. It's fee to feasible or fee determinable. And concurrent ownership, you know, that, you know, that, that's not what we're lo looking here. We're looking for ownership with the, the, you know, the least amount of restrictions and that would be fee simple absolute answer A. Let's go to the next one, please. Number four, which of the following is a contract? An encroachment. An encroachment is an is a tr illegal trespass. It's someone that's using your property or on your property or built something on your property that had no right to do that. Uh, it's it's always illegal and uh, can be uh, you can force them off, probably with some sort of a court action and whatnot. But you know, but that that's an encroachment. And that is not a contract. Uh, a comparative market analysis. Well, that's just an estimate of value. That's certainly not a contract. Chattel is just personal property. That's not a contract either. Well, that only leaves us D, which is our correct answer. A leasehold estate. A leasehold estate is any tenant has some rights. And we call this a leasehold estate. You know, it's, it's a non- it's certainly possessory, you know, they have the right to move in and, and possess the property, uh, but it's not ownership. It's less than freehold. Freehold is another term that means ownership. So a great example of a less than freehold estate would be whatever rights a tenant has. And that's what we're talking about here. There, it, is a, it is definitely a contract, you know, between a landlord and tenant that gave them the right to be there as long as they pay their rent and don't violate the other terms of the of, of, of the rental agreement, but it's a leasehold estate. And don't, don't let the word lease mess you up. Lease, you know, you tend to think, well, that's a long-term type of an agreement. Yeah, it could be, but even a, a month-to-month agreement is a leasehold estate, okay? Number five, owner C gives a deed to his son until his son dies. His son sells his interest in the, in the property to a friend. Uh, in other words, he sold his interest in the property, which was a life estate, okay? You, you can sell your life estate if you want to, if you can find someone who will buy it too. Okay, so what happens is, um, when does the interest in the property terminate? And that's our question. When does the property uh, interest or the ownership terminate? Well, his ownership was only a life estate. So the correct answer to this one is gonna be B, when his son dies. The, the current owner of the life estate, his friend that bought it from him, um, is, uh, uh, owns a life estate, uh, but it's not based on their life, okay? It's based on the original person it was set up for, which is this other son. So that's why one of the reasons they're hard to sell. Um, however, you know, if it's a, well, let's say it's a condo on Park City and you can rent that out. 
And if you can rent it out during um, Sundance and maybe, and maybe rent it out, you know, during the ski season or, um, you know, that, that sort of thing, you might be able to make 30 or $40,000 renting that out if you only paid 30 or 40,000 for the life estate, because you're not getting full ownership, you're just getting a life estate. That son could die at any time. Well, you know, if it's 25 years old, you know, well, he's probably gonna have a pretty decent lifespan unless he does a lot of off resort skiing like in the mountains and is subject to avalanches and things like that. Could, could, could be. Um, but another thing you could do if you were the friend that bought the life estate is you could get a life insurance policy on the son. So if he died, you'd lose the ownership of that condo. But on the other hand, you know, you'd have the proceeds from the life insurance. So you get the money back. So, you know, that might be one way that it, it can work out. Um, life estates are, like I said, they're very rare. You probably won't see one except for on the exam <laughs> because it has some great terms and things that go with it. So, you know, pay attention to that as you're going through your material. Number six, he leases an apartment uh, for a couple of years, okay? And after two years, they've not found a new place to live in yet. And so they re remain on the property for a few more months. So what kind of an estate do they have? Do they have an estate at will? Is it like living in a hotel or something like here at the Mirage? No, that's not what we're talking about. You know, they had a lease. They were in the apartment for a couple of years. Still haven't found a place to live. So they, 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 they held over. They want to stay. And they, you know, they continue to pay the rent. Is that a life estate? No, we kind of talked about life estates in a very brief, sketchy way. But a life estate is, is given to someone where they own the property, but yet, they only own a life estate, they, you know, and, but it's only good for someone's life. If it's the holder of the life estate, that's one thing, but it could be someone else's life, you know, which would be a life estate pure autre V based on the life of another. Uh, so those are why there's some reasons you need to know about life estate, but this is not a life estate. There's not, there's really a renter's estate. That's just a made up term, uh, pretty much a state of sufferance. That's the right answer. Because someone's suffering here, well, kind of, you know, it's it's the landlord because they didn't honor their agreement, which was to leave at the end of their lease. But on the other hand, maybe he didn't have another tenant that wanted to move in immediately, and he's happy to continue to take the rent. Um, if they're not paying the rent, then, you know, during that two-year period of time, which is not this question, because they did pay the rent for the two years. But if 18 months in, they quit paying the rent, <laughs> still in a state of sufferance, um, and of course, the landlord probably started an eviction, unless it was during COVID, and then they couldn't do that because of some federal mandates. But on the other hand, there were a lot of programs. Um, you know, during during COVID, I was actually a broker of a, of a large property management company. We did we did about eighty eight commercial properties, but we had about three hundred residentials. And uh, out of the residentials, we only had. Um, about six that quit paying rent and we were able to plug them into some state programs and get most of that money for our owners so it was kind of funny because some of the tenants didn't want to be very helpful because you know they had to supply all their information as a tenant to uh, the governmental authorities you know the the state authorities in order to get that money and that help and that assistance but on the other hand, I mean, they, they had nothing to lose. I mean, you know, I, we were ratcheting up what their account balance was. And, you know, we had full intention of suing them, you know, when, when we had the right to, to recover some of that money. So it, it, it was a win-win deal um, for the tenant and the landlord if they would cooperate in getting the rent uh, help, the, the subsidies that were available. And so we did. And so uh, we didn't have a lot of, we, we didn't have one owner that suffered without getting something, okay? And it wasn't the full rent on a, a, a couple of the rental properties, but, you know, it was better than nothing. And no, no. Was, when was the last time you had a shower? Did you put on clean underwear? Yeah. Well, hopefully I'm not on. Is that you?
mute somehow? Dan, am I not? I think I might have clicked your mute by accident. Sorry, Rick. Okay, all right. Number seven. Okay, a transaction where the buyer of the property immediately leases a property back to the original owner. So you had an owner, he sold it to someone else, but he stayed in the property. Okay, so is that illegal, A? No, no, no. B, a, a lease sale back. C, unethical. Or D, a sale lease back. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a sale lease back right because they sold the property to a new owner and then he went ahead and uh and uh and and, and moved out okay uh, well they didn't move in they didn't move out right away they leased it back for a period of time it's not uncommon okay um banks don't like it i mean they if the the owner, if the new owner, if the buyer got a loan to buy this property and they specified that the loan was going to be, you know, that they were going to owner occupy, you know, then they're not going to like a sale leaseback, uh, not for a long period of time, a month or two, you know, maybe 60 days, um, you know, they probably no problem at all. But, you know, if they're going to want to stay there six months or a year or something, that's not going to fly with the bank because because the loan was done based on the fact that the, the, the new buyers, the new owners, the, uh, were going to live in the property. And the reason why that's important is because uh, people that are buying rentals, if they run into trouble like COVID, tenants aren't paying a rent and whatnot, you know, a lot of times uh, that becomes a problem for the bank because they quit making their payments. I can't make the payments. I'm not getting any rent. You know, well, that's not a good situation. So the risk on a non-owner occupied loan is higher than the risk on an owner occupied loan because most people, you know, they'll let a car go or they'll let almost anything go or not make payments on things, but they're gonna pay their house payment because they need a place to live. And that's kind of what, why the banks um, will lend you that much money and, you know, to buy these properties and whatnot. Many times with even very low down payments, is because they know the chances of default are lower if you're going to be living there. Uh, so they don't like sale leasebacks, uh, you know, if, if they're for long periods of time. Really makes the underwriters have heartburn. Let's go to number eight, please. Tune in, I mean, uh, chime up at any time. If you guys have any questions, happy to help on any, any topic. Because sometimes, you know, what's really cool about taking the exam is you're going through the exam and uh, there was a question like three or four questions ago and you know you answered it and you thought oh, i'm not quite sure i don't no i don't know anyway so you, you you made your selection you're you're working on another question and another question and another question you get down to that that third question and it sparked your memory and you remembered what that other question and and so you 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 can scroll back and make sure you've got the right answer so sometimes that one question will give away the answer to another question. And so you might want to, you know, you can scroll back and check and make sure you, you did the right thing. And sometimes you can scroll back and, oh my gosh, I was thinking of something else. That is wrong. This is the right answer. That's the only time you should ever change your question when you're taking your test. I mean, I've got a young man sitting over here that uh, recently took the test and it wasn't with the best result, um, but he's going to make it this time, right? Yeah, okay, okay. So give him a little, uh, he's sitting in for a little tutoring here. And so it, it's, don't change the answer to a question. Usually your first impression is right, unless there was a, a subsequent question and it, it sparked in your head, oh, I remember now, it was that other thing, and then go back and you can change that one. But that's a legitimate change. Anything else, guys, you're probably, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree. So number eight, thank you. Uh, unlike a, a married couple buying property, if two people who are not married buy a property together, they will most likely be A, B, C, or D. A is joint tenants. B is tenants in severalty. C is tenancy by the entireties. And uh, uh, D, which is the correct answer, is tenants in common. Now, this is an excellent example of 
of when the test deviates from reality of real estate. And most of you are not taking a broker's exam, you're taking the sales exam. And so you really kind of have an advantage in that you don't have any experience in real estate because really lots of unmarried couples are buying real estate and who really dictates how they're vested in title? Who tells them they need to be joint tenants? Take a wild guess. Well, if you guess the bank, you're right. <laughs> the bank, even though they're not married, wants them to be joint tenants with full rights of survivorship. Now, why would a bank want that? Well, because if one of the two died, they don't want any hassles with probate. They don't want any hassles with, uh, with anything that would, that would come and challenge that title uh, in the event of the death of one of the owners. They want it just a very clean, upon death, it immediately went to the remaining joint tenant. And joint tenancy isn't just for couples. It could be three people, it could be four people. You know, you could have a mom and three of her daughters that bought this property together. So there's four owners and they all own as joint tenants. When mom passes away, the three daughters now own the property, just the three of them and another daughter dies and it's just the two daughters and another daughter dies and there's just the one daughter where if they all die, then well, you know, we're going to have to have some sort of a probate proceeding to figure out, you know, or look at some wills and to figure out who never, the owner is. Now, joint tenancy, remember you have the four unities, PIT, P-I-T-T, -T, possession, interest, time, and title. All four of those have to be in place to have joint tenancy. Uh, tenants and severalty, even though it, that looks like there's several of us, it's not several of us. You see the word sever and severalty you're severed or cut away from everyone else. So tenants and severalty, even though there's an S, tenants and severalty, that's really kind of a misnomer because in tenants and severalty, there's just one owner. You own it alone, okay? Tenancy by the entireties is legal in the state of Utah. Uh, and uh, tenancy by entireties is joint tenancy, but there's an additional requirement that you have to be legally and lawfully married. And um, it's, it's not used much. The advantage of tenancy by entireties over joint tenancy is that one owner in, in the couple can't sell their interest without permission of the other. They can't, cannot encumber their half interest without the permission of the other. Under joint tenancy, uh, even though you're married, uh, Joint tenancy, not tenancy by entireties, but in joint tenancy, your spouse could sell their half interest. Or your spouse, if they're an entrepreneur and you're signing note loans and you're getting kind of business deals and some of those deals go sat sideways, if somebody sued your spouse, you weren't involved in these business deals, but they sued your spouse or you weren't involved in that loan, signature loan, the bank sued your spouse, they could come after your spouse's 50% ownership, even though you would be opposed to that. It, it wouldn't matter. I mean, they could still come after that person. By tenancy by the entireties, uh, it's a little harder for the bank or for someone that was just suing your spouse to get at that property. Now, understand, you know, if they got great lawyers representing them. Eventually, they could break through that and probably get there. But... Um, but they have to do additional hoops. So the difference between tenancy by entireties for married couples, and that's the additional requirement, right? Is that one spouse can't screw up the other spouse's interest by putting another person in their place or being sued and whatnot. It's just a little bit harder. Even though it's legal in Utah, is it used? No. Who really determines how they're vested in title more than anyone? And like I hinted at, it's the lenders. You know, the underwriter comes back and they just assume that you're going to be uh, joint tenants. If that's a problem for you, you're going to have to clean that up after you bought that property because it, they're, they're going to make it a requirement of the loan that you buy it as joint tenancy. It, you know, whatever's best for the lender <laughs> is what they're going to do. And that's, what, and that's why they do it. Uh, now, after you've taken title as joint tenants, and let's say you wanted to change it to something else, uh, you, you can change it at that time. You know, but um, going in and getting that loan put on the property, they're, they're going to require that. Let's go to number nine, please.
Okay, if two people are joint tenants and one of them sells their interest in the property to a third party, the remaining owner and the new owner become what? Remember, joint tenancy required those four unities, right? Possession, meaning they both have equal right to possession, interest, they own the same percentage of interest. That's a really big one because I've seen uh, and have actually written <laughs> for many of the test organizations, a test question where it said that, you know, there were two owners, one owned two thirds of the property and the other owned a third, okay? Um, what type of ownership do they have? Well, there's only one kind of ownership where they can have an unequal proportionment of ownership and that's um, tenants in common, okay? So in this case, these two people are joint tenants. They weren't tenancy by entireties. One of the owners sells their interest to someone else. So the new owners, because even though they may have same position, they may have 50-50, time and title are what trips that up in the four unities. Did they both come into title at the same time? No. And um, with the same document? No. Okay, so one of them came in later with a separate document from one of the half owners. So that breaks up the ability to be a joint tenant. So they are in fact, tenants in common, okay? Which means that if one of the owners dies, who gets their interest? It's not the other owner, it's their estate, the estate of, of, of the decedent, you know, the one that died. Let's go to number 10, please. Now we have four brothers. And they own as joint tenants. Is that possible? Yes. A lot of times we think as joint tenancy was just two owners. So I love this question because it, you know, it clearly shows you that there could be more than one owner. And it's not uncommon to have three owners or so. Um, four is a little many. So it's kind of, well, you know, it's different. But if two people are, wait a second, we're on 10. Four brothers own a property as joint tenants. It is appreciated quite a bit in value since they made the investment to buy it. Uh, since they made the investment to buy it, uh, must have been in Salt Lake for a couple of years, huh? <laughs> and about 22 to 26 percent a year increases. One brother wants to sell and get his money out, and he has a ready, willing, and able buyer to buy it. The others refuse to sign the offer. Uh, what's the possible legal so uh, solution here? Well, if you're in a partnership and um, the partners don't agree, uh, then you have to do something, you, know, you might do something called a partition action. A partition action is an action of court where you get in front of a judge and say, your honor, you know, we own this property together, but we can't agree what to do with it. So you have to decide <laughs> you know, what we're gonna do. And most often the, uh, the judge will say, well, you know, if you guys can't agree, I want you to sell the whole property and split up the money. Or they, you know, they probably won't force them to, to, to do the other guy, but you know, they, they might, you know. So anyway, um, that's a partition action. An estate pure uh, that was like the life estate where the life is, the, the duration of that life estate was based on someone else's life, okay? A writ of execution, that's a court order. See, when you get a judgment against someone, you won your case, ah, this is real exciting. And you leave the courthouse, you go down the elevator, you get in your car, well, we won that one. I knew we'd win, that's great. But the, you don't have the money, you have a judgment against this individual and, uh, and they don't pay and they don't pay and they don't pay. Well, you could go back into court and ask the judge to issue a writ of execution. And uh, a writ of execution is an enforcement of that judgment. And it might be against a, a piece of property. So you now have a lien on that property. Uh, better yet, if you can find out where they bank and they have enough money in the bank to pay that judgment, you get a writ of execution from the judge, show up at the bank, and the banker will take the money out of that other person's account, that person's account, even though they're gonna scream and yell, they're gonna take that money and pay you because there's a court order. They have to follow the court order, okay? That's a writ of execution um, or exercise a defeasance clause. A defeasance clause is a clause in an agreement that allows you to defeat it for one reason or another. Uh, but that wasn't our example here. You know, I didn't mention anything about a defeasance clause. Let's go to number 11, please. In a community property state, which there's about seven of them, uh, Utah, of course, is not one. I mean, come on, you know, with brick 
Brigham Young have ever set it up that way <laughs> with 20 some wives. I mean, yeah, it's just too complicated, you know. In a community property state, if you're legally and lawfully married, then the spouse's name doesn't necessarily have to be on that property, but they're still a joint owner, you know. And so community property states are states that primarily have Spanish origins. So they're going to be mainly in the Western United States. I mean, could also have French, you know, like, you know, Louisiana. Um, Wisconsin voted it in. They thought it was a cool idea. But there's not that many states. There's only about seven of them that are community property states. But it's going to be on the test a lot. California is probably the biggest community property state. And our other neighbors, uh, <laughs> like Idaho and uh, Arizona, Nevada, they're all community property states. Well, they all had Spanish origins. Okay. So that's kind of how that works, guys. But Utah is not. Okay. Let's go to uh, number 12, please. What does a condominium owner have exclusive interest in or ownership in? What do you own if you really own a condo? Do you own the party walls? You know, those common walls with, with your neighbor next door? No, you don't own those. Uh, the shared stairwells. <laughs> no, that's usually owned by the association, okay? Or the shared entrance is the same thing. What you own is your airspace for your unit. You own from this sheetrock to that sheetrock over there, okay? You own the, uh, and of course you have a common ownership in the dirt underneath the condominium and of course all the, all the public areas like we looked at just a moment ago. All righty then, let's look at number 13. Kind of, kind of getting down to it here. If someone has the ability to use a property once a year uh, for one week at a time, they most likely have what? Well, you know, I'm here in Vegas. <laughs> There's a lot of them here. And that would be a, a timeshare, okay? Because it doesn't matter if it's deeded or if it's points or, you know, how it's set up. The concept of a timeshare is you buy your vacation. And so you, you pay a fee, uh, which, you know, can range from, you know, thousands to tens of thousands of dollars, depending on where it is uh, and how valuable that property is. But you, you buy the right to use that property. Uh, it could be every other year. Most of them are for you know, every year use. And uh, you know, there's different ways to trade that and do other things with it. But that's what it is. It's not a periodic lease because you're not leasing property. You own it. It's not a lease for years you know, because you know, that's, that's not what it is. You have ownership. And it's not a quick claim title either. OK? OK, questions about anything else? Okay. Well, it's been nice to be with you tonight. I, I, I would like to uh, share uh, a story. Uh, many of you know that when I started in real estate in the, in the late 70s, it's been 44 years for me that I was rookie of the year. And uh, that was cool. First year I sold 58 properties. Um, last night we had a, a, a breakout meeting. We had a, a gentleman that came in and spoke. Uh, he's, a, of course, an EXP member, and he was talking about some of his keys to success and whatnot. A very successful individual. Uh, but before we started the meeting, we asked how many people, you know, because the topic of his uh, talk was how to, how to sell 50 properties in 2022, okay? And he went through what you know, he feels you have to do to sell 50 properties in 2020, really interesting. But before we did that, we asked how many people had actually sold 50 properties uh, in any one year period of time. And there were only like three hands that went up out of a group of about 110 people. Um, I want you guys to sell 50 properties or plus your first year. Okay, if you don't make your first year, you can do it your second year. But how are you gonna do that? It's going to take commitment. It's going to take commitment. And you're going to have to commit to activities which will bring your business. You're going to have to put your, yourself in uh, situations where you're outside your comfort zone. You're going to have to push. You're going to have to stretch. You're going to have to grow. Real estate is like a crucible that you throw yourself in 
and then they heat it up and they burn it up and all the dross and he was burnt out. You're going to have to become a committed, dedicated individual. And you can do this, but you're going to have to want it. And you're going to have to put yourself in situations where it's going to be uncomfortable. Okay. You want to get hit by a truck, not particularly, but if you did want to get hit by a semi, you're going to have to get out on the freeway. Okay. So let me give you a couple of rules. Okay. For you to go out and really make a success of this. Okay. You can make an excellent living in real estate selling a dozen properties a year. I mean, just run the math. Okay. <laughs> but you really want to create um, financial security for yourself or obtain wealth, it's going to take extra effort. But here are two rules. Rule number one, show up. Show up. Surprising to me how many people I've hired over the years, especially when I was running large offices with a hundred and some people in it. And I'd hire these people and they'd show up for, you know, 10 days and then they would get showing up, you know, and I'd call them on the phone. Hey, I didn't see you this week. I didn't see you today. You know, let's get in here and get some, get, get going. How are things going? You know, and if you want to make it in this business, you have to show up. And I mean, show up. You know, when I first started in this business, one of the ways that I uh, was able to, to tag into some uh, multiple uh, transaction buyers was I showed up when other agents weren't showing up. I joined a firm. I was a ninth agent that joined that firm. Uh, it was an old established firm and, and it had uh, a great location and had uh, a lot of listings. Um, but the other eight people that were there were extremely established in the business. So they would go home at five, 5.30 or so. I wouldn't go home till seven, eight o'clock. Why? Well, I figured that a lot of people that might be looking to buy properties um, would get off work around five. Maybe they go home, get a quick bite to eat, grab their spouse, and maybe they're driving around looking at, and making calls on signs. Uh, and if you agents back in, in the 70s were foolish enough to put their their company number on the sign, which I suggest you never do, put your personal cell phone number on the sign. You want people to call you. And I'm not talking about a name writer on top of the sign with a company number. The company number is probably bigger than your name writer. You want the only number to be on your signs, your number. You want them to call you. You want them to call this, okay? So that you can get that lead. Well, I was going to the office and I would get calls and uh, uh, I would pick up buyers, you know, and Saturdays I would go in. These established agents were working on Saturdays or the only Saturdays they worked on were when they had a buyer and they, had, they were in their car or out showing properties. Well, one Saturday I was sitting in the office and uh, a gentleman walked in. Uh, I call him a gentleman. He had long hair. He had a beard. He had a, a Vietnam flak jacket, Levi's and Vietnam combat boots. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay. Well, what is this guy? Homeless guy or what? You know, he was clean. You know, he looked good and beard was trimmed. Anyway, he came in and he says, hello, my name is Ivan. And I see you have a property out by the airport. I just saw the sign, thought I'd drop by and get some information on it. I have a friend that likes to buy these kinds of things. Really? Okay. So I dug around, found a flyer on the property, gave it to him and said, well, you know, Ivan, can I have your number? I'll follow up with you and whatnot. She says, no, 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 no. I'll go ahead and send this information to my friend. Uh, he lives in California. It turned out he lived in an extremely ritzy place in California. He has his own aircraft. He'll fly in sometime and uh, I'll just call you and let, let you know, could you meet us out there? It says, absolutely. You know, so uh, on Monday, he calls and says, hey, my, my buddy's going to show up. This is Ivan, by the way. I came in Saturday. Yeah, all right. Oh, yeah, my buddy uh, wants to look at this property. Uh, he's going to fly in in, in his Beechcraft. Uh, he's going to fly in uh, Tuesday. Can you meet us at the property about 3 o'clock? I said, absolutely. So that's how I was. I met Dan Hopper. Uh, he was a friend of Ivan's. So Dan Hopper shows up at the property 3 o'clock. I show him the property, and uh, he likes it. You know, it's out by the airport. Thought that was pretty cool. Uh, it was a, a reasonable size, you know, a little over an acre, almost two acres. And um, he wants to write an offer. So uh, we go back to the office and I write up an offer for Dan. Now, a curious thing here on this property was it was owned by my broker. <laughs> okay. 
anyway, uh, so we make this offer on the property and I, I get it to my broker and we, you know, we talk about it, we negotiate a little bit or he wants to negotiate and whatever. Okay. And, um, he said, well, let me think about it, Rick, you know, I'll call you tonight. So I go back to my little tiny apartment. Now you got to understand when I started in real estate, I was broke. Okay. You know, I, you know, as a snot nosed 20 something year old kid, uh, I had a Volkswagen Bug, which is not the best car for real estate. Didn't even have air conditioning, <laughs> you know. And um, this one deal, okay, was big enough that it would get me out of this crappy little apartment that I was living in, okay, with my wife and one child, my firstborn son. And it was a small little apartment. It had one of those Pullman kitchens, you know, where there's a countertop here and the stoves right here and there's like you know three feet between it you could walk back and forth only one person could be in the kitchen at a time anyway so the broker called me and he said rick i'm not going to accept that but i would accept this you know as a higher amount so i said okay so i called dan hopper on the phone i said dan hi congratulations he wants to do business with you and this is the price he would accept not the one you offer but this one and Dan says, nah, it's too much. I don't want to buy it. Let it, let it, let it go. You know, maybe, maybe we can find something else. And he said, yeah, thanks a lot for working on it, Rick. Uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. And he hung up. <laughs> so I'm, I'm walking back and forth. Okay. And I, you got to understand, okay. 20 something year old kid, Volkswagen bug. Don't have two nickels to scratch together. Dan Hopper, I mean, he shows up in the, the quintessential California uniform, you know, I mean, you know, cashmere sweater, <laughs> fancy loafers, flies his own aircraft in, meet him out at the property. I mean, the guy is really intimidating to me, you know, I, I, very successful guy, you know, multimillionaire. Anyway, so, but I want this deal. So I'm getting out my calculator and I'm looking, it was like, it was like, 20 cents more a square foot, you know, <laughs> it's ridiculous, you know, which leads me to the second rule. Remember the first one is what? Show up. The second rule is don't give up. Don't give up. So I picked up the phone and I called Dan Hopp and I said, Dan, this Rick. Oh, Hey, why did you find me another property? Wow. I was fast. I said, no, Dan. You're letting this deal go for 20 cents a square foot, Dan. 20 cents a square foot. Come on. There's not a lot of properties out the airport for sale. This is one of the primo deluxe locations because of the streets it was on and whatnot. It's got to be worth an extra 20 cents a square foot. Long pause. You know, Roller, you're right. Tell your broker, that's fine. I'll do that. And that's how I met Dan Hopper. Dan Hopper could buy anything. It didn't matter. It didn't matter what it was or how much money it was. If it had potential, he could buy it. Why? Because he was a syndicator and he was putting together deals with all his rich buddies who lived in this swanky part of California where he lived. And he'd made them millions of dollars. So when he would call, it was more like, how much of this deal do you want? You want half? Do you want the whole thing? You know, half would be 500 grand. You want the whole thing, it'd be a million dollars. I'll take the whole thing, Dan. That sounds pretty good. You know, it's, that's what he did. And he, his deal was they'd put up the money. He'd find the properties, take care of them, work the deals. And it was a 50-50 split. So he'd done quite well for himself as well, all on other people's money. He was a syndicator. He did, did, did really well. But because of that, because of that, okay, I got Dan into over in my first year, those 58 properties I sold, six of them were to Dan Hopper. And they were bigger deals. I mean, it was fantastic. I mean, we bought a 10 acre parcel out near a mall that was coming into our area. We paid $10,000 for the 10 acres. It was a pig farm. We resold that 10 acres, okay. We started piecing it up, you know, we subdivided it and we started selling it off for $1.37 a square foot. The last pieces we sold, you know, for $3 a square foot. 
There's 43,560 square feet in one acre. Well, $3 a square foot, <laughs> you run the math, okay? <laughs> he only paid $1,000 for that acre, okay? Well, Dan was very happy with the deals I was able to bring to him. And in uh, fact, one day, he didn't show up in his airplane. He showed up in his little Mercedes two-door coupe. And I said, Dan, I didn't know you're coming to town. Wow, how nice. You called me. Let's go to lunch. Yeah, okay, great, fine. We went to lunch together. At the end of the lunch, he handed me the keys to his Mercedes and said, you know, Rick, you did such a good deal for me in these last few deals. I want you to have my car. You just got to take me back to the airport, okay? <laughs> nice bonus. Okay, anyway, folks, two rules. Show up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Be tenacious. If Now, don't be obnoxious. If they have no need for anything, if there is no need for your real estate services, you're not going to, I don't care how good you are. I mean, some of you may have sales backgrounds. I mean, maybe you used to sell Kirby vacuum cleaners or rainbow vacuum cleaner. Oh, I can close and I can close hard. Yeah, but you're talking about a three, $4,000 machine. You know, you're not talking about a $400,000 or plus property. Okay. It's going to be diff if, if they don't want it, if they don't need it, they're probably not a good prospect for you at all. Okay. But if there is a need, and they keep telling you, no, don't give up. Come back with a different approach. Come back with something else, okay? Make them offers that other agents won't do. And lots of examples of this. If you will show up in this industry, and if you don't give up in this industry, you're going to do fine. You're going to do more than fine. And some of you are actually going to create a legacy for your family from this. Well, thanks so much for being with Dan and I tonight. Does any, anyone have any closing questions like Stacy, Michelle, anyone have any other questions you'd like to say or ask? Go ahead. Chime in. Just unmute. Okay, well, then I'm going to go back to the festivities here in Vegas. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you tonight. Remember, you can always call me at any time, 801-556-8000. That is my secret cell phone number. So appreciate you being here tonight, guys. Take care, and we'll see you next time in two weeks. Thank you, Dan. Great, great to have you here. Great to be here. Thanks, Rick. Really appreciate you. Thanks, everyone, for being here. We'll see you in two more weeks. Bye.